everyone and welcome to our video lecture on defense mechanisms. We're going to talk about uh, how animals have basically adapted to predation and all the different ways that they have this evolutionary arms race of predator trying to catch the prey and prey trying to evade the predator. So this is uh, a little uh, lizard called a horny toad. It's actually a lizard, not a toad at all. And you can see that it has defense mechanisms. It has little spikes all over its body, which make it seem kind of tough to a predator. So a predator might think twice before it attempts to gobble up this specific creature. So let's dive right in. There we go. The first thing I'd like to talk about is something called aposematic, aposematic coloration. Now, aposematic coloration is basically warning coloration adopted by animals that have some sort of chemical defense system. So this right here is a blue jeans frog. Sometimes it's called the strawberry poison dart frog, which um, shows that basically most of the frog is usually red bodied and then it has different variations. When I went to Costa Rica, there was a lot of these little guys that are very, very tiny. You can see how tiny they are. They're incredibly poisonous. In fact, if you had an open cut on your hand and you went to pick one up, you could get toxin in your bloodstream and have some pretty big issues. Uh, but they are actually, we are actually more harmful to them. They're cold blooded. So when we pick them up, they um, were our hand, our body temperature is warming them up. So you can actually kill one of these just by picking them up. So if you happen to be in Costa Rica and happen to see a blue jeans frog, just let it be and admire how beautiful it looks and say, hey, look, that's aposymmetric coloration. So this, this prey, a frog is prey, um, has this really bright coloration to tell predators, hey, just so you know, I'm really bright. That means I have a chemical defense system. So over time, predators know that, oh gosh, that's a really bright frog. Last time my brother got kind of messed up when he ate a really bright frog. So predators learn over time not to mess with bright frogs or bright colored animals. I like to think of it as a car alarm. So when your car has an alarm, you typically have a little light, um, something that blinks within your car that tells the burglars, hey, just so you know, like there's an alarm. So if you mess with me, there's probably like a good chance that you're gonna get caught, right? So aposomatic coloration, bright colors that warn predators that they are toxic. So let's look at another kind of defense mechanism called Batesian mimicry. And it was named um, by the guy who kind of discovered it. His last name was Bates. So he named it after himself. I'm still waiting to discover something, so I could call it Ewingian or Ewingian something. Anyway, so Batesian mimicry is when a harmless animal copies an appearance of one that has aposematic coloration. So predators fear them based on interactions with bright, poisonous kind of lookalikes, imposters, even though they're not poisonous at all. And the most popular example is the eastern coral snake right here. This is poisonous, venomous right there, and the scarlet king snake, which is non-venomous. And there's that saying that, uh, what is it? Red, red and black, a friend of Jack, red on yellow will kill a fellow. So if you see the color red next to yellow, then you know that's the coral snake. That's pretty poisonous. I should stay away. But if you see uh, red next to black, notice that red and black never touch on the snake. Then it's a friend of Jack. It's a king snake. And actually, people have king snakes as pets as well. Uh, another example of Batesian mimicry is this beetle here. And this beetle is kind of, you can tell it kind of looks like a bee. This beetle has um, no stinging abilities. It's just a beetle going about its day. It's actually called the bee beetle or the beetle bee. And it looks exactly like a bee so that things that might want to eat it would think twice and know that bees sting and have um, toxins available for their use. And so they won't eat this beetle. Another common 
But actually, if this is Mythbusters, this myth would totally be busted. The story of the Viceroy butterfly and the monarch butterfly. Now in your textbooks, it's going to give you this as an example of Batesian memory. However, that's a huge lie. Recent studies show that this is more of an example of Mullerian mimicry, which we'll talk about. But the idea is that a monarch butterfly is nasty tasting, basically, to birds. It tastes like crap. The birds are like, ugh, why did I take that? It's like really unpalatable. It'd be like us eating, I don't know, what's unpalatable? Like those popcorn jelly bellies, right? Super gross. So we know that that's the popcorn one. We avoid that color, right? Because we're like, oh, that could be a popcorn one. That could just like ruin my whole night. So this monarch butterfly tastes really bad. And originally, we thought that the viceroy butterfly just looked a lot like the monarch, but actually didn't really taste bad. But turns out that the viceroy butterfly is sometimes even more distasteful than the monarch. And we're going to bring that up again a little bit later. So an example I like to use for Batesian mimicry is um, I've used a car alarm for aposematic coloration. So my car, this is the, a picture of my dash on my car, and you see I have this little light right here, and it says, you can't read it, but it says anti-theft. And my car is a Honda, and we paid for no bells and whistles. We do not have a car alarm. Don't tell everybody this. <laughs> We do not have a car alarm. However, it has this little light that blinks that says, hey, this car looks like it has a car alarm, but really there's no car alarm that's going to happen if you try to break into the car. So um, my alarm system is basically just a blinking light, and that would be an example of car Batesian mimicry. Let's take a, uh, a look a little deeper on cryptic coloration. This is kind of the cool stuff that you see in nature. Um, here's a mantid, and actually mantids are amazing at cryptic coloration. They have mantids that look like orchids, mantids that look like blendin with the same exact flower. Um, so we have a mantid right here. As you can see, it definitely its whole body looks like a leaf. And uh, here you can see we have a little stick bud. And cryptic coloration is basically a fancy word for camouflage. Camouflage is a hard word to spell. Camouflage. Okay. Basically, the idea is that I'm going to look as much as I can like my natural setting. And so that when a predator does come through and is hungry, it actually can't see me because I blend in so well. So this is a really awesome adaptation that we see a lot. Like if you were a bright pink lizard in the desert, you probably would have a hard time existing because you would stand out and things would want to eat you. However, if you're a lizard that looks like the bark of the tree or the color of the sand, it's going to be a lot harder for a predator to detect you. The next thing I'd like to talk about is another adaptation called deceptive markings. And we see this a lot actually in marine life um, and especially in insects when they're in their young larval stage. Um, before they have their hard exoskeletons. So uh, deceptive markings are basically just things on the prey or on the species that make it look like it's bigger or more tough than it really is. So on this, we have this little deceptive marking. And if you look at it, it kind of looks like a giant eye, right? So if you see something with a giant eye, you might think, wow, the body that belongs to the eye is probably really big. So I'm going to think twice before I start attacking this and eating it for my dinner. Same with this is a little caterpillar. And you can see it's got these fake little markings. They're, they look like little angry eyes, right? But really the eyes are set much further back and it kind of gives the predators a... a deceptive look like, wow, this, this thing could be tougher than I'm expecting, so I'm going to try not to attack it, and maybe I'll choose something else. So those are some deceptive markings. Let's talk about our last adaptation, and this is Mullerian mimicry. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. And Mullerian mimicry, it's kind of a hard one to say, is two species that are aposematically colored, which means they both are poisonous, 
and they're aposematically colored because of their chemical defense mechanisms. And what happens is these two completely different species will actually mimic each other's color scheme in an effort to increase the speed in which predators learn to avoid them. So basically the predator is seeing more dangerous prey this way with that same color scheme. So they will develop a negative association much quicker. And that species, those both species, they mutually benefit from it because they both will be uh, hunted less quicker, I guess. So a really good example of that is, um, you know, bees and yellow jackets are in different, uh, or bees and wasps are in different classifications of arthropods, which is insects. And uh, this bee and a wasp are both poisonous. This is a yellow jacket, and you could see that the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket look really similar. They have the same markings, their wings look similar, even their abdomen, this is their abdomen, um, is the same shape. Uh, so they tend to look really similar, and the scientists believe that they evolved this way to help basically teach predators quicker that they mean business <laughs> when it comes to hunting them and they won't mess around. And of course, this is our, uh, this is our monarch right here. And this is our viceroy. So next time you hear the example of the monarch and the viceroy being an example of Batesian mimicry, you can correct them and say, actually, they found that it's more of a case of Mullerian mimicry because they both taste bad and they both had this coloration, the same kind of look on their wings so that their predators know that, ooh, I'm not gonna eat something that looks like that because it tastes bad. So in review, we talked about the evolutionary arms race and how that causes specific adaptations against predators. We also talked about aposomatic coloration and that is like the blue jeans frog, things that are really brightly colored to warn predators that they are toxic. Uh, we talked about Batesia mimicry, and that's between two completely different species. One species is actually poisonous, and the other one mimics the poisonous species so that it could kind of take advantage of the training of the poisonous species it has given to the predators. So they just look dangerous even though they're not. Cryptic coloration is basically camouflage, so a way that a animal, an insect, a amphibian, anything blends in with its environment so that it can't be seen by predators. Deceptive markings are markings on a on a prey. Um, usually it's eyes, typically it's eyes, that make the prey look bigger or more dangerous than it actually is. And then Mullerian mimicry is when you have two aposematic colored species, two different species that mimic each other's markings, their bright markings, so that they can train the predators quicker not to eat them. And I hope you enjoyed this video cast, and I hope you're having a great day. I will talk to you soon. Bye.